We will start out by acknowledging that those at our Trothyra campus in Fairbanks are on the unceded customary lands of the Dana people of the lower Tanana River. In Nome, we are on Inupiaq, Yupik, and Siberian Yupik lands. We honor the continued fight for the rights of First Peoples and stand together in solidarity and action. At UAF, we are growing into a socially just and caring institution of higher education. This ongoing speaker series titled Shine a Light, Promoting Conversations on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is designed to encourage understanding, build empathy, and engage us in thinking critically about our worldviews. The series is led by the Northwest Campus, but like all great diversity efforts, there are many partnerships and collaborations. We would like to thank UAF's Department of Equity and Compliance and the Nanook Diversity and Action Center for partnering with the Northwest Campus to bring this series to reality. You can find recordings of past presentations on the Northwest Campus's website under the Outreach tab. This link will be added to the chat. This semester, our Shine a Light events are during the noon hour of each third Tuesday of the month. Again, thank you for being here today, and we hope you continue to join us. I would now like to introduce and thank our speaker, Robert J. Miller, for today's presentation on the international law of colonialism in Alaska. Professor Robert Miller is the faculty director of the Rosette LLP American Indian Economic Development Program at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. He is the Willard H. Pedrick Distinguished Research Scholar Chief Justice of the Pasqua Yaqui Tribe Court of Appeals, and is a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. Miller's areas of expertise are federal Indian law, American Indians and international law, American Indian economic development, Native American natural resources, and civil procedure. Today, he will be discussing the international law of colonialism, also known as the doctrine of discovery, which dates back to the early 15th century. European nations use this law to claim and establish colonies and empires around the world. Miller will examine how Russia, Spain, England, through Captain James Cook, and the United States made doctrine of discovery claims to what is now Alaska, and how that law impacted the world history and imposed colonial rule and serious injuries on the indigenous nations and peoples who inhabited and utilized what is now Alaska. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that Robert may address at the end of his presentation. Um, and you are more than welcome to use the chat feature, but please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A feature so we don't miss them. Thank you. And at this time, I will turn it over to Robert. Thank you very much, Casey. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, put quotes around the word here in uh, Fairbanks. I'm actually in Phoenix, Arizona, of course, where it's a chilly 70 degrees today. Um, I'm delighted to speak with you. I've been to Alaska a couple of times, kayaked uh, up in the, I forget what that's called, the National Park. Uh, went into St. John's Arm on July the 1st, something like 2008. I've ended up writing about what's called the International Law Doctrine of Discovery because my tribal council appointed me to the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial in 2003. I was a brand new law professor at that time and thought that, gosh, what did President Thomas Jefferson know about the law of discovery? What did Lewis and Clark, those two explorers, know about the doctrine of discovery? the international claims that European and later American countries made to the non-Christian, non-Western world uh, parts of the world. And it has led me to write two books on the subject, many law review articles, and then I wrote a book chapter in 2015 on Alaska. I will show you the cover of that book at the end of my class. You might be interested in it. It's primarily about uh, James Cook and the search for the Northwest Passage that many countries were seeking and that it implicated what is now modern day Alaska and the indigenous peoples that are there. And so I'm talking to you today about this international law of colonization, exploration, as Casey said in the United States legal world and most of the world, we know this today as the doctrine of discovery. And uh, we will talk about that briefly, the legal side of it, how it developed, yes, in the 15th centuries, primarily by the Catholic Church and Spain and Portugal, developed this international law controlling the exploration by European Christian countries of the rest of the world. 
Uh, I published an article just back in April about how England and Germany used this international law to colonize and claim East Africa. Uh, this happened in the 1800s and the 1900s. So this is a legal principle that still applies to indigenous peoples around the world. And here in the United States, this case that I'm going to talk to you about defined the doctrine of discovery. This, I've, I've been teaching federal Indian law since 1993. You start teaching federal Indian law classes with this case. Chief Justice John Marshall, our most famous chief justice, wrote three Indian law cases. They are called the Marshall Trilogy. We teach them all the time. This is his first opinion, and it's about international law. It's actually about who had the right to buy land from native peoples. And at bottom line is what rights in property, in land, do American Indians have after Europeans showed up with their cross and their flag and stuck them in the soil uh, as they walked ashore in Virginia or New England or Florida or California, et cetera. This case is between two non-Indians arguing over a piece of land that's now in the state of Illinois. Mr. Johnson had inherited shares in a company that his grandfather had been a part of that had gone around the woods of what's now Illinois and Indiana in 1773 and 1775 and allegedly bought land from chiefs. We don't know if these deals were legit, if they were real, if this alleged chief had authority to sell tribal lands or not. But this is how Mr. Johnson inherited shares in a, a large portion of land in modern day Illinois and Indiana. Mr. McIntosh, however, purchased the land in 1818 from the United States who had signed treaties with the Indian nations in that area. The Illinois tribe, the Illini, excuse me, so that's where the name of the state Illinois comes from, the Illini tribe, and the Piankashaw tribe. And so their challenge as they're fighting over this piece of land is, did Mr. Johnson's grandfather and that corporation acquire legitimate title to these lands at question? Or did only Mr. McIntosh have the title because he bought it from the United States? who bought it from the Indian nations through treaties. Fascinating case, 30 pages. I've read it so many times. I, you know, <laughs> uh, Like I say, I wrote a book on the subject. But here's the three key points we want to talk about. And then this principle applied in Alaska. It applied during Russian times from 1741 forwards. The claims Russia made to the land and over the indigenous peoples. This law applies to the claims Captain James Cook made in three different places in Alaska, modern day Alaska, I will talk about later, and then the United States later. What did we buy from Russia in the treaty? I, is it 1868 or 1869? I think it's 1869 that we signed that treaty with Russia to allegedly acquire some rights that are in modern day Alaska. So what did the Chief Justice write? What does Johnson v. McIntosh stand for? This country, the United States, was settled on discovery and conquest. In this opinion, Marshall looks back at what was then 400 years of European history and law to define who had owned this property that was at issue here, Mr. McIntosh or Mr. Johnson. And uh, Chief Justice Marshall writes, this country was settled not only by legal claims of discovery, but yes, by conquest. What did discovery do to Native nations? It limited their land rights. Real property is the fancy word we lawyers use for real estate, for land. Wow, tribal lands, I will break this down a little more in just a minute, but tribal lands Tribal ownership of their lands and rights to their lands were limited when a European Christian showed up with their flag and their religious symbol to stick in the soil. Indian nations also lost some of their sovereign powers because of this international law, this ethnocentric idea that somehow European Christians 
were more important than the rest of us people, the rest of the world. Now, so I wrote an article on this. It was literally my tenure piece in 2005. I wrote an enormous article called The Doctrine of Discovery in American Indian Law. But the next year, I then turned that article into a book. And I came up with something that all lawyers do, all judges do. We broke this principle called the doctrine of discovery down into its constituent elements. Lawyers and courts and legislatures do that all the time with crimes or with what we call tort lawsuits. If I'm going to sue you for the negligence, I have to prove four elements of the tort of negligence. So being a lawyer and a law professor, I started thinking to myself, well, what makes up the doctrine of discovery? And I want to cover this pretty quickly, but these are the 10 elements, factors that I, by reading Johnson v. McIntosh so many times, I could see Chief Justice Marshall and the court applying these elements to defining what the doctrine of discovery is and historically looking back at how Europeans had enforced this claim of international law against indigenous peoples. And this has been applied around the world, folks. I've written articles on how Spain used the doctrine in Chile, how Portugal used the doctrine in Brazil. I just mentioned just this past year, publishing that article about East Africa. First discovery was absolutely crucial. When a European country showed up, they planted their flag and cross. We're going to hear that James Cook was famous for putting British coins in, in glass jars and burying them. He did that in three different places in modern day Alaska. What a good way to prove where you've been. Other countries mapped the areas. Uh, the Dutch, when they first landed in Western Australia in 1616, they hung up a metal plate that said, we've been here, this now belongs to Holland. Wow, European countries did that around the world. But second, and this began in 1550s when Queen Elizabeth I developed this aspect of the international law of discovery, was that just finding it wasn't good enough. You couldn't just find it and then claim it for all the time. She said you had to get back there and actually occupy the area. Now, I'm going to argue to you in a minute, the Russians are, occupied Sitka and two or three other spot places in Alaska. It was partly to fulfill this element of international law, to solidify the Russian claim to own Alaska under international law. Preemption, what happened to the land rights of native peoples? And this goes back very much to what Johnson v. McIntosh is about. What happened to the land rights of the Illini Il Il tribe and the Piankashaw tribe? Well, Europeans, by walking ashore, acquired some sort of right in the land. Now, we're going to practically my last slide is a case about Alaska from 1954, I think the Tehatan Indians versus United States. And we will see these elements used against the Klingit and Haida peoples in that lawsuit called Tehatan. So Europeans claimed that just by walking ashore, they had some ownership rights in the land. Uh, that's like me coming over to your house and putting my Bob Miller name on your front door and sticking my Bob Miller religious symbol in your front yard and saying, I own part of your house. Sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? Native title, what, what was left over for the indigenous peoples? Well, in Johnson v. McIntosh, the court said, oh, Indian peoples own a very valuable property right to occupy and to use the land. But Marshall said they don't own the complete fee simple title to their land. Fee simple absolute is a word you will all learn when you come to law school here at Arizona State University, take my classes. Uh, you will learn that that's what we consider under English and American law, the ultimate ownership you and I as an individual person can have of a piece of land. This comes from a thousand years of English law, the fee simple title. But native nations didn't own the fee simple title anymore once a, Euro once a European country showed up. What else happened to Indian peoples? Well, this comes directly what I just told you Marshall wrote about. Tribes lost some of their sovereign powers. They lost some of their commercial rights and powers. 
And that was a part of the doctrine of discovery. Contiguity. Uh, I'll show you a map in a moment. When a European country landed on the coast of what's now Virginia, contiguity defines how big of an area they claimed. And we're going to see that finding a river mouth was the most important thing to find because European and American countries then claimed the entire drainage system of that river. Let me, I don't have the map next. I was going to run you ahead to a map, but we'll look at a map of the United States in a moment. And we'll talk about what, why, what are the borders of Alaska today based on European law, based on treaties, the United States and European countries signed dividing up uh, indigenous lands. Terra nullius, the Latin phrase for empty earth. If land or an island, let's say you land on an island, there's not a single person there, it probably makes some sense that you can now claim it. But Europeans and later Americans use this phrase very liberally in their favor. You might be surprised to know that England claimed Australia for 160 years, claiming that it was empty when Captain James Cook arrived near Sydney in April of 1770. What's very interesting is 1992, the Australian Supreme Court said that that was a lie and the court cannot perpetrate a lie and perpetuate a lie. And they said English ownership cannot be based on terra nullius. And the Australian parliament passed the very next year, the Native Title Lands Act, and Australia has been slowly re reversing the doctrine of discovery to some extent and recognizing and granting title to aboriginal groups and tribes in the various places of the continent of Australia. Maybe that's a good example for what the United States should be thinking about. Two elements, conquest and, dis and Christianity. I got to keep an eye on the clock because if I start talking about the doctrine of discovery too much, I get too excited and I'll talk for an hour just on this. Conquest, winning in war, absolutely past title. Even there's literally international law folks developed in Europe, developed in other countries around the world. What did King A get when King A wins a war against Queen B? What rights pass from Queen B to King A by a conquest in war? And that idea has been part of the doctrine of discovery. And Chief Justice Marshall writes about it a little bit in Johnson v. McIntosh. But let me just tell you my second meaning. I think I wrote this in my book as a new thought. European Americans acted as if their mere arrival in the lands of indigenous peoples was like a military conquest. Go back to number three. Why did Europeans and Americans think they had acquired some underlying ownership of indigenous lands just because they showed up? It's because they perceived just arriving as a, like a conquest. I don't think I have to explain to any of you that Christianity, religion has always been a justification for European American domination of indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, the taking of Africa was largely justified by Europeans by, oh, we'll bring them Christianity. And number 10, civilization. You know that American colonization, European colonization, Again, the Europeans in Africa, as they carved up that continent, they primarily claimed they would bring the Christian religion and civilization to these wild, savage African peoples. They said the same thing about my tribe. They said the same thing about the peoples in Alaska, indigenous peoples. So these are what I argue are the 10 elements that make up the doctrine. And I use these elements in analyzing how these other articles I mentioned, how Spain applied international law to colonize Chile, Portugal and Brazil, and then this article about England and Germany and East Africa. I think in most of those examples, these European countries, these European laws apply these doctrines, these elements, excuse me. And Johnson v. McIntosh recognizes that was international law. For, don't, don't forget the date of Johnson v. McIntosh, 200 years old this year. But it was looking back 400 years to determine what the international law of indigenous peoples and European claims 
what was that law to decide this lawsuit between Mr. Johnson and Mr. McIntosh over a piece of land in Illinois? Now, I had to, that's quite a story. There's a lot there to unwrap what the court was doing, what it needed. It was looking for the law to apply to this concrete property dispute between Mr. Johnson and Mr. McIntosh. And the law, the doctrine of discovery. And we call it now that title based really on Johnson v. McIntosh. My, Johnson is a very important case. Canadian courts have cited it more than 70 times. Australian courts have cited it more than 40 times. New Zealand courts have cited it more than 20 times. This idea of the doctrine of discovery has been used against indigenous peoples all around the world. Okay, uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, we said it came from the early 1400s, from the 15th century. Well, this this question over what Europeans owned when they found the lands of non-Europeans started developing in the early 1400s when Spain and Portugal developed both the technology and the ships that could sail long distances. They found the Canary Islands and Spain and Portugal began arguing over who owned it, who could exploit it. And so they turned to the Pope. And in 1436, the Pope issued a papal bull if you've never heard that, B-U-L-L, -L, that's an order from the Pope, from the Vatican. And the Pope granted the Canary Islands to Portugal to civilize them and colonize them and convert them to Christianity. And also for the King of Portugal to acquire sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title. Now, does that sound like the doctrine of discovery, what I explained to you, those 10 elements? Portugal continued exploring down the west coast of Africa, and they turned to the Pope for more papal bulls, 1452, 1453, and this one from 1455, granted Portugal the right to invade, vanquish, defeat in war, subdue all Saracens, that was their word for Muslims, and pagans, to re and look, to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to possess their lands and assets. Now, that's a pretty ugly looking uh, order from the Pope granting Portugal this right to dominate, enslave, kill, do anything they wanted. Well, Spain, if you notice, Spain had been left out of these papal bulls, and Spain was pretty mad about that. So guess what? When Columbus shows up in the court of Isabella, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, they sign seven contracts with him. They send him to the West. They promise in the contract to make him, and this is a quote, the admiral over any lands you acquire for us, period, close quote. Now, what were you and I taught in school Columbus was doing? Wasn't he only looking for good prices on pepper and, and cinnamon and stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's a little bit of what we do learn from history that's not the full story. In fact, spices are only mentioned in contract seven that he signed with the king and queen. The other contracts were about finding new lands and acquiring them for Spain. And as soon as uh, Columbus landed on a couple of islands in the Caribbean, he rushes back to Spain they send their lawyers to see the current pope, Pope Alexander VI, and they say, we want a papal bull now. And Alexander uh, agrees and issues four papal bulls in 1493, granting Spain rights in these new lands. Now, I have a quote there. They even use the word discovery, discovered. Spain had these land had land rights in these lands that had been undiscovered by others. I put in the, you know, a joke there. What about the natives that lived there? Hadn't they discovered the lands where Columbus landed? Of course, the Europeans didn't care about that. The Pope also said, you are, you own these lands, Spain, if they're not previously possessed by any Christian owner. So this shows the importance of first discovery. This is the developing of this international law of colonialism or the doctrine of discovery. Pope uh, Alexander issued a second papal bull. This also makes me always think, what did we learn in school? That Columbus thought the, the earth was flat? 
I'm afraid that's another thing we were taught in school that's maybe not, that is not true. I guess we know the earth's not flat, right? But the Pope drew a line around the world from the North Pole to the South Pole. So in 1493, the Pope and the world knew about the North and South Poles. They knew the earth wasn't flat. But look what this, most of this is a quote, I think. Uh, let's see, no, I, only a bit of it is a quote. But I'm going to show you this line that the Pope drew, granting the world for the Portuguese and the Spanish to conquer, to acquire, and of course, to expand Christianity. Here's the line. If you have studied your world history, you will read about the line of demarcation. The first time I read that, I had no idea what they were talking about. And only now that I've done this research, well, this is now 20 years ago, but did I learn that that dotted line is the line that Alexander VI drew in his paper bowl, papal bowl, Intercatera II, dividing the world for the Spanish and the Portuguese. Now, of course, well, not of course, but Portugal was not happy with this line. They wanted a little bit of South America. They thought there were lands out there. And so look to the left there. Spain and Portugal signed a treaty in the city of Tordesillas in Spain one year after the Pope drew that line. And Spain and Portugal moved the line 500 miles to the west. And that's the line of division they agreed to comply with. What language do they speak in Brazil today, folks? What language do they speak in the rest of the New World uh, until you get you know, well up into the United States? So you know who mostly colonized these areas. Now, they didn't know anything about the Pacific Ocean in 1493, but once the Spanish crossed Panama in 1513, Balboa finds the Pacific, claims it for Spain, and Magellan sails around the world in 1521. He sails around the southern tip of South America. They want to claim the Pacific. Spain and Portugal sign another treaty. Look at the lower right-hand side. They went to the Spanish city of Zaragoza and signed another treaty in 1529 and drew that line uh, through the New World or through the Pacific. It's, uh, excuse me. It's how the Spanish apparently end up with the uh, Philippines. Uh, the Dutch are primarily in India and the Japans. And you may not know this, but when uh, Captain James Cook landed near Sydney, what modern day Sydney in 1770, he only claimed the eastern part of Australia because the English were aware of this line. They assumed the Dutch or the uh, Portuguese, but by then the Dutch owned the west part of the continent of Australia. Okay, here's the map I promised you. Uh, this takes you back to that element of contiguity. How did the United States grow the way it did? What's the Louisiana Territory? What are the boundaries? I'm from the Oregon country, born and raised in Portland, Oregon. What is the Oregon country? Now, Alaska's not on this map, but we'll talk about that in a bit. But notice that... Uh, the Louisiana Territory is outlined by the western drainage system of the Mississippi River. The Oregon country is defined by the drainage system of the Columbia River. I told you earlier that finding the mouth of a river, making your claim there, planting your flag and a cross, building a trading post or a fort or establishing a town, those were the important things. So the Louisiana Territory, when, when President Jefferson and Congress made that treaty with France, and we allegedly purchased the Louisiana Territory, this is another falsehood you and I have all been taught, and I bet 99% of Americans do not know the truth. In school, you were probably taught this was the greatest real estate deal in history, and the United States paid only three cents an acre. But I'm going to take you back real fast. What did we buy from France? We did not buy the land because France did not own the lands. Indigenous peoples lived out there. Many dozens and hundreds of tribes lived in what's now the Louisiana Territory. 
What we bought from France was this preemption power, this made European title, which I really didn't say this at the time. The European country that discovered a new island or a new area first actually occupied it, acquired a legal right, a property right to be the only buyer of that land when the indigenous peoples chose to sell. And I hope I explained that clearly enough. That is what we bought from France, folks, the preemption power, the right to buy the lands from the indigenous peoples. Because remember, what did Chief Justice Marshall say? The Indian right is a sacred one. The Indian right in land, it's a very valuable one. The right to occupy and use land. Well, that's about all land's really worth, isn't it? Live on it, farm it, cut to trees, mine it, occupy it. So the native title was still very valuable. It just wasn't that full fee simple absolute title that European law recognized. The Europeans acquired the preemption title, the preemption right, when they showed up with their flag and their cross. That is what we bought from France in the Louisiana Treaty. Now, I'm going to remind you of a little history maybe you don't know, but the United States, uh, history proves that we did not buy the fee simple title from France. We bought the right to buy the land from the indigenous owners. Because American history shows that the United States for the next 100 years signed 100 treaties and agree made agreements with the Indian nations in the Louisiana Territory and bought most of the land in that area and paid about $300 million to those tribal nations. What did the United States acquire in the, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Russia, Spain and England claimed the Oregon country. We, the United States, showed up kind of late. We claimed it under first discovery because an American is apparently the first Euro-American that sailed into the mouth of the Columbia River in 1792, sir, uh, or not sir, but Captain Robert Gray, an American whaler from Boston, sailed his ship up the mouth of the Columbia River, found it, put it on a map, told the world. What did I tell you earlier about contiguity, the contiguity element of, doc of Doctrine of Discovery? The United States now claimed that it owned the entire drainage, or had the preemption right to deal with the indigenous peoples and to be the only buyer of all the lands in that entire area. Think now about the Lewis and Clark expedition. The reason I got involved with this, I think I said, was when my tribe appointed me to be a representative on the United States Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial back in 2003. Jefferson told Lewis and Clark to go the, to the mouth of the Columbia River, and that's where they built a fort. A replica is still there today. So we claimed first discovery. We claimed the first actual occupancy by the fort that Lewis and Clark built in 1805 to 1806. And then an American fur trader crossed the continent in 1808. John Jacob Astor, his American fur company, he wrote Thomas Jefferson, who was president, and says, I'm thinking of building a fur post on the Pacific. Oh, maybe at the mouth of the Columbia River. Jefferson was ecstatic. He writes him a letter back. Here's a quote. He says, quote, I will give you all the support the executive can provide, period, close quote. Jefferson wanted a permanent American city, town, fort, trading post at the mouth of the Columbia River to have a claim to that entire drainage system. Astoria, the city of Astoria, still there today, named obviously after John Jacob Astor. Okay, well, let's get to Russia. Russia involved in these international claims, this doctrine of discovery? Well, the question is absolutely yes. And this is the research I did in 2014 for a chapter I have in this book published in 2015 you might be interested in checking out. 
So Russia's first entry into the islands in the uh, Bering Strait, the Aleutian Island chain, and ultimately on the mainland of what's Alaska today, 1741, Peter the Great. His explorers named geographical features. I didn't mention this earlier, but this is another way Europeans and Americans claimed new lands that they found. They named mountains. The Lewis and Clark expedition, as they went across the continent, they named every river, every stream, every mountain. They literally ran out of names. They were naming them after their relatives. There's a pretty famous river in the state of Montana today that is named, everyone thinks it's the Marias River. It's Maria's River, named after William Cook, uh, uh, William Clark's uh, first cousin. So Russia knew about making these kind of international claims. They mapped these claims, they publicized these claims, and they, they claimed the lands. Uh, Catherine the Great, well, Peter the Great, I forget, was Catherine also called the Great, but in 1764, she sends these two names. Of course, these are new names to me. Some of you may know these names because of uh, Alaskan history. Look at the quote, what she directed them to do. Confirm the discoveries already make, made, referring back to Peter the Great, 1741, Bering and Chirikov. Oh, gosh, before I forget, why is it called the Bering Strait? Of course, because of that, one of those first Russian explorers. And to make further discoveries and to subjugate the inhabitants. That looks like three or four of those elements as I defined from Johnson v. McIntosh. After James Cook showed up, folks, this is interesting. After the English sent James Cook to nose around in Alaska to look for the Northwest Passage, Russia and Spain got very concerned about their claims to the New World, to what's now Alaska. I was literally hiking on a mountain in southern Arizona this weekend, and there was one of those historical plaques, and it literally was talking about the most famous Spaniard, Spanish explorer from the southwest here, and how he went through what's now Arizona to California and established all those Spanish missions up the coast from San Diego to San Francisco. And you know what the historical sign said? I took a picture of it. I like freaked out. It said that Spain was doing this to counteract English and Russian claims in the San Francisco Bay Area. Many of you may not know, but Russia allegedly sent explorers as far south as San Francisco Bay. And James Cook sailed through there. Sir Francis Drake sailed, allegedly sailed through that area in 1579 and claimed those lands for Queen Elizabeth I. So this idea about the doctrine of discovery was around for, yes, now 600 years, and European countries were competing with each other to acquire lands. We're going to talk about just a moment what Spain did in reaction to James Cook and in reaction to what the Russians had been doing. But look what Catherine II orders after she learned that James Cook had been in the area of Alaska. Quote, she sends another voyage, a firm our right to all lands discovered and to include them among the possessions of Russia. So she reacted because James Cook had showed up. And I think it's the next slide. I have the Spanish uh, reactions. Here's what Catherine II ordered. More quotation that I found in various you know, documents, etc. To bury metal plates to erect the Russian crest, that two-headed, uh, is that a dragon, the Russian sign? I don't know if it's a dragon or a lion, but the Russian crest was planted in various places in what's now Alaska, perhaps as far south as the Columbia River. Some of these crests have been found in other places. We're not sure if they just were put in burial sites or if the Russians had planted it there. The only one of these plates that's been found, folks, if you go to the museum in Sitka, you can see one of these Russian bronze plates that they planted or buried in the ground that said this land belongs to Russia. And the plate that is in the Sitka Museum is, uh, is number 12. There were apparently 30 of these plates 
solid metal plates planted by Russian explorers. Only the one has been found that I am aware of, and it's number 12. So go take a look at it. You'll be looking at the actual symbol of the doctrine of discovery. Physical manifestation of this international law of colonialism. Look what she also ordered. She says, if other countries had left proofs of being somewhere, she told her explorers to destroy them because Russia, she claimed, had made the first discovery, prior discovery. International law, that's what they, oh, here, I got ahead of myself. Uh, hey, my memory is really good, isn't it? Because I had not hit that button yet found in the mid-1930s. I did forget that, but it's number 12, and it's in Sitka. And look what it says. It claimed this area was the country and possession of Russia. Russia appointed governor generals that were in charge of the Alaska fur trade, and most of the Alaska claims were done by private fur traders. There were really only, I think, these three official Russian expeditions that were sent to Alaska as I have mentioned there. But Russia relied on their private citizens to make claims. Exactly the same the United States did in regards Robert Gray founding the mouth of the Columbia River in 1792. I didn't mention this at the, at the time, folks, but he named the river after his ship, which was called the Columbia Red Aviva. And so he named the river Columbia. Again, that's how Europeans claim things. They mapped them. They left objects. They tattooed trees or, or, or used the branding iron on trees. In fact, I forgot to mention that. When Lewis and Clark crossed our continent in two, 1803 to 06, they took a branding iron with them. And they were branding the landscape when they were out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Spain. What did Spain do? What, how did Spain claim as far north as Alaska? Well, they looked at that line the Pope drew in 1493, and they said, everything over there is ours. Balboa found the Pacific in 1513. Magellan round South America in 1521. Uh, Cortez and his troops crossed to the Pacific in modern-day Mexico, 1536. But in the late 1700s, Spain got worried about Brazil, uh, Russia, and certainly Captain James Cook. I already mentioned that they started sending missions to the north. These are just some of them. I write about them in that chapter in the book I'm going to tell you about at the end. Oh, I see it's 43 minutes. Okay, we don't need to belabor these too much, but look again, you may know these names, these places that this Captain Heseda went to, to the 65th degree of parallel. I think that's really far north. I'm no expert, but is, I think Anchorage is at the 60th degree of latitude or 61 maybe. So Heseda was ordered to go way above that and to engage in acts of possession, doctrine of discovery, leave objects, raise the Spanish flag, claim it for Spain. Here's Ortega go, goes Prince William Sound. He took possession and took possession on the Kenai Peninsula. The Aleutian Islands, Carlos III orders other explorers, again, to try to, to look for Russian settlements and to take official possession, and they did so at these uh, three locations. In 1790, England and Spain got into a bit of a kerfluffle off of Vancouver Island, and Spain signed a treaty ceding some of its rights to England. It's uncertain what that treaty really said and meant. Uh, but England, of course, claimed that it now had all of Spain's first discovery rights, all of Spain's rights under international law, I guess even under the papal bulls from 1493. What did Captain Cook do? Well, Captain Cook, you might know, made three voyages around the world. Each one of his voyages was disguised as just a scientific mission, as the United States disguised Lewis and Clark as just a scientific mission, but their real mission was empire, doctrine of discovery claims to the Oregon country, pure and simple. So Cook is sent with these secret instructions from the Admiralty. Maybe you've been reading it already. I've underlined the key points. 
So he was sent to supposedly observe a solar eclipse in south, the southern hemisphere. That was one of his trips. I forget if that was this 1776 one, but now he goes to uh, Alaska. He's looking for the Northwest Passage, but he's making claims, doctrine of discovery claims. Look at my elements there. If the natives consent, if you find indigenous peoples with their consent, take possession for the king. If you find an area that's never been visited by another European, claim it for us and leave things that prove an Englishman has been there. This is exactly why Cook did what he did. Now, here's the rest of, well, let me back up. I already mentioned this. Uh, instead of just raising the spent British flag and then walking off with it, Cook was smart and buried English coins in glass jars, hid them, kept track of where they were, I suppose, although no one's ever found any of these. So if you'd like to go dig stuff up, go look out on Possession Point in the Cook's Inlet. Ah, why is it called Cook's Inlet? Ah, do you know Possession Point? Look on your map. That is the location he sent Lieutenant William King and some troops ashore to take possession for England and to bury these coins. Some uh, Alaska natives saw them. They write in the journal that 10 or 12, I forget what word they used, maybe natives, were watching them and they waited till they had left before they buried the glass uh, with the British coins. wonder if the natives were able to find that fresh dirt hole and dig up what was in there. I don't know. But anyway, look what the Admiralty ordered Cook to do. If you find terra nullius areas, areas with no people at all, claim it for the king, set up proper marks of the fact that you were the first discoverer in possession. Cook did this in many places, Australia, Tahiti, British Columbia, and three places in Alaska. Uh, when he landed in Tahiti, he even erased some paint marks that the Spanish had left. So I've read that Spain learned about that, and they sent another ship out there to repaint it. Gosh, that seems a little childish, but in those days before GPS, what else could you do to prove where you had been? But Captain Cook, I'm, I've already probably said all this, but the, the English claim that Francis Drake made it as far as the 45th degree of parallel in Oregon which is about Salem, Oregon, if you know where Salem is. So Portland must be at about the 46th degree of latitude. So Cook was ordered to sail around the world, hit the Oregon coast at the 45th degree of parallel, and then go north. England was trying to connect its alleged explorations, its alleged first discovery claims around the world, and then go as far north and hopefully find a Northwest Passage. Cook knew the importance of publicizing what he had found. And look at the phrase he used. He asked the Admiralty to publish and fix the prior right of discovery. Everyone knew what the international law of colonization was. This was no surprise to Cook, to the British Admiralty, to the Tsar and Tsarina, to the kings of queens of Spain. So Congress even noted what Cook had done. This is a uh, report from the U House of Representatives, the United States House of Representatives. They were aware by 1826 what Cook had done up there. Cook landed in three places, named them, and buried these coins. Key Island, Kayak Island, I don't know where that is, somewhere in Alaska. I certainly know where Cook Inlet is and Possession Point. And I also do not know where Camp Newenham is, but maybe you all know. And then I wrote a chapter in this book. Oh, I have the cover of this book at the end, but you might have this book in your library if you want to read my chapter. Anyway, let's see what time it is. Uh, are there any questions, Casey, we should be paying attention to? Or? I can wait till the end. Okay. Uh, I think I have this as a slide, but the United States signed a treaty. Let me see. I think I have this soon. The United States signed a treaty with Spain in 1821 
and Spain withdrew its doctrine of discovery claim to the 42nd degree of latitude south. Now, you might not be the least bit surprised to find out that that's the boundary line between Oregon and California today. The year before that, we signed a treaty with England and with Russia. Uh, I thought I had that as a slide. We signed a treaty with Russia three years later about Alaska and what's now British Columbia. And Russia agreed to keep its claim only as far south as the 54th degree of parallel. That's the very southern tip of Alaska to this day. So these boundaries were set in law based on these doctrine of discovery claims by European American countries uh, passing these rights back and forth and recognizing each other's claims. But we in England continued to argue over the Oregon country, uh, the Pacific Northwest. And I have read the letters that our Secretary of State wrote to the British foreign ministers, and they argued over who discovered this area first, who occupied it first, who owned it under international law. We argued for three decades. Robert Gray found it in 1792. Lewis and Clark built a fort at the mouth of the Columbia in 1805. And uh, John Jacob Astor built a trading post there 1811, still occupied by Americans today. England argued Sir Francis Drake, Captain James Cook, the Hudson Bay Trading Company, and then the post that they built along the Columbia River as they advanced across the continent. They cited that treaty with Spain in 1790 that I referred to earlier. They also relied on the explorations of George Vancouver, I believe, in 1793, when he came along Alaska and came down to what's now Washington, et cetera. So the boundaries were being made. All that's left is the United States and England arguing about this area. And we divided the line with the United States finally in that 1846 treaty. Okay, let's see what time it is here. Okay. Everyone was aware of the doctrine of discovery. Today, we barely know this international law unless you're involved in Indian law and read Johnson v. McIntosh. People are just, oh, this is like a brand new thing. But everyone understood these claims and these laws back then. In fact, I got to tell you this, part of American history, James K. Polk was our president. Maybe you've never even heard of him. He ran for the presidency in 1804 with this slogan, 5440 or fight. I ask every one of my audiences when I give this talk, do you know what 5440 or fight means? Very few people know. Do you think a president runs for office with a slogan, a campaign slogan that people don't understand? Well, of course not. So everyone alive in 1844 knew what James Polk meant. And I should go back clear to the map, but he was literally arguing that if we did not get all of British Columbia clear up to the southern tip of Alaska at the 54th degree of parallel, of latitude, excuse me, we were going to go to war with England. That's how he got elected. And of course, we didn't go to war with England. You can see my last bullet point there. We signed the treaty with England and divided Canada and the United States at the 49th degree of latitude parallel that it is today. But isn't, I mean, to me, it's extremely interesting how this international law of colonization defined the expansion of the United States define the expansion of the world and colonization around the world, all to the detriment of indigenous peoples. Now, let me see uh, what my next slide is. Okay, well, let's talk about this. But now, who do you think won the Johnson v. McIntosh case? I didn't tell you that, did I? I bet you know, Mr. McIntosh, who got his title from the United States, who signed treaties with the relevant Indian nations, that's the title that was good. Mr. Johnson's title was invalid, void, because Indian nations could not sell the fee simple title to individuals. They had to sell it to the European or American country that owned the doctrine of discovery right of preemption. 
Now, these don't come in as a bullet point, do they? Oh, I had the date wrong completely. Uh, so what does the United States buy from Alaska in 1867? Well, allegedly, only the same things we bought in the Louisiana Purchase. We now should have bought any lands the United States wanted in what's now Alaska from the indigenous owners. But it didn't quite work out as well for indigenous nations in Alaska as it did in the lower 48. And you can see they were left to the mercies of the United States. That treaty that we signed with Alaska protected Russian citizens. It said, I don't have it as quotes, but it protected Russian citizens' property and their religious rights. And if they stayed there, they could become United States citizens. It did not say anything like that for indigenous peoples. Of course, we didn't have anybody at the negotiating table, did we? This was just Russia and the United States uh, negotiating about this land. Now, the treaty said something, though, and I have the quotes there, the uncivilized native tribes, uncivilized, that's my element 10 from the Doctrine of Discovery, were subject to the laws and regulations as the United States might adopt. That's my element four, the limited sovereign rights that indigenous nations retained after they were discovered. Of course, the indigenous peoples weren't lost. That's why I put quotes around that word. It's, it's just asinine. It's ridiculous. The people that were lost were the European and American explorers. Anyway, so that's where uh, Alaska natives were left. And Congress passed a law in 1884 about Alaska, passed another law in 1900. Both these laws were at issue and were discussed by this case that I mentioned I would talk about. Gosh, I see we have about three minutes. This case is even worse, worse than Johnson v. McIntosh. The Klingit and Haida Indians that were involved here, called the Teotons, were claiming the United States could not steal their timber off of their lands. The United States Supreme Court denied their right, any right, in their lands. And that's why I say it was even worse than Johnson v. McIntosh. The Supreme Court cited Johnson, as I have written there, cited it correctly. Indian title can only be purchased or won in a war. But the Supreme Court ignored that completely and recognized really no land rights for Alaska natives. I, you know, I teach that case every year and my mouth hangs open. I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, it was in 1955 in the era that we call the termination policy of United States Indian policy. They were trying to get rid of tribes, stopping no longer did the United States want to have a political relationship with in, indigenous nations. And this Teton case reflects that kind of thinking. Now, let me just show you. I know you're going to want to buy some books. Uh, this was my first book I ever wrote. This is the paperback edition. Uh, here's the second book I ever wrote. I co-wrote this with Aboriginal professors from Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and we analyzed how England applied the doctrine of discovery in our four countries. I'm, a I'm sorry this doesn't show the full cover because this native person has a cross planted in his forehead. I think that is very powerful imagery. And it's a Canadian, a native from Canada that painted this and let us use it. Uh, his last name, I think, is Little Chief. Here's the book that might be in your library because that's where my chapter is on the doctrine of discovery. Okay, I've filled an hour. I have two more hours to talk, so stay around. Uh, <laughs> Casey, are there any questions we should address? Yes. So thanks so much, Robert. And just so everyone knows, I know some people have to get going right at the hour. Um, this will, we'll stick around and answer, ask some questions, and it, they will be available on the recording later. So the first one is, was the possession of Alaska from Russia to the U.S. a purchase or a lease? It was a purchase, a treaty, and Russia, I guess, just needed the money, didn't see value in Alaska. And they sold it to the United States. I believe it was for $8 million. And there were a lot of, or was it, fifth, I think, $8 million. A lot of congressmen were very unhappy. They said, you've spent money we don't have for an icebox we don't need or for land that we have too much of. So that was kind of a funny, you gave away money that we don't have enough of. 
for more land that we already have too much. Another question, given that the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971 expressly extinguished the Aboriginal title system, how should Alaska courts deal with its history of the doctrine of discovery when they are now precluded by law from now adhering to principles you mentioned in the pre, like the preeminence concept? The Tiaton case, like I said, is even worse than Johnson v. McIntosh. So indigenous nations I'm not an expert on Alaska Native law. There's a treatise, I'm looking at it, you can read, it's called Alaska Natives and the Law, and it's written by two people I know, uh, David Case and the other guy's named David, but I'm blanking on his last name. So if you want to look at a treatise on Alaska Native law, it's in its third edition. Uh, now I almost forget the question. Uh, Tiaton disregarded indigenous rights completely. The United States mostly ignored Alaska for all those years because until for all those decades, because until they found oil, the lower 48, I suppose, didn't think too much about Alaska. Now you had to settle native claims before they could build that 900 mile pipeline. You had native peoples, tribes stepping up, claiming you can't build that pipeline across my land. So Congress very quickly enacts uh, what ANCSA. And your the question said 1971. Uh, for some reason, I'm thinking 69, but I could easily be wrong. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. The United States wanted to get Indian claims out of the way of all that oil and that pipeline, and that what that's what got enacted. But at least recognized title to, I believe, 44 million acres of land in Alaska was granted to the regional corporations that that act created. And that act then also created, I believe, about 200 village corporations. So in one fell swoop, that Congress enacted, I suppose, 150 years of federal Indian law and history on Alaska. Boom. But because of this a, a dire emergency to get to the oil. I think that answers the question that was asked. Uh, native rights are recognized up there. So indigenous nations are better off than they were under Tiaton, that's for sure. Some people argue that ANCSA was like the Allotment Act in the lower 48 states. If you know anything about the Allotment Act from 1887, it's considered the worst thing Congress ever did to Indian nations and Indian reservations in the lower 48. And some people say that ANCSA was kind of like an allotment act. Thank you. Um, someone commented Case and Volok. I believe that's- in Yes, yes, the... Dave, David Case and David Volok. They both, uh, David Case practiced law in Anchorage for 30 years representing uh, tribal nations and villages, et cetera, and corporations and David Volok is still up there. Awesome. And another comment and question uh, said, so thank you for the inclusive and forthright chronicles of history. Do you present for secondary students or, and or do you know of curricula slash resources for secondary teachers? I think my this talk is on YouTube. Ooh. I gave a talk November 17 in Philadelphia for the National Constitution Center about another topic I've written about for decades. It's titled American Indian Influence on the Constitution and the Founding Fathers. And I will send this link to you guys later, these two links, if you want. The National Constitution Center, that's on YouTube on their YouTube page. Uh, I'm pretty certain this talk I just gave must be on somebody's uh, web page. So I'll have to think about that. But yeah, talking to high schools, I, I just, you know, I don't have that much time to do it all. So that's the value of videoing. Well, in fact, Casey, aren't we videoing this? Yes, we are. Well, then surely we will make this available to people, right? Yes, it will so be posted yeah. on uh, our website. I will tell you folks the, what your question made me think of, whoever asked that, this talk I gave at the National Council, there were only a few people in attendance in the auditorium, but there were many grade school and high school classrooms watching. So I guess I do do trainings for secondary students. <laughs> So someone else asked, there are tribes in Alaska that do not have ANGSA lands, Arctic Village and 
oh, I'm going to butcher this, Metcalac, oh, I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, Metcalac. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, with ANCSA being open to change, what do you see as possible changes in the future, considering that we are now? Well, the reason I know the what you were trying to say about Metlakatla is my old law firm, which practices nothing but Indian law, we've represented Metlakatla since 1961. Metlakatla, the ANCSA Act, folks, allowed tribal nations to opt out of the application of ANCSA. Metlakatla is the only Indian tribe, indigenous group in Alaska that opted out. So that's the reason... Uh, Metlakatla, they have their original reservation lands. They do not have ANCSA law, ANCSA recognized or ANCSA allotted lands because they opted out of that law. Uh, let's see. So the rest of the question, yes, you, you know, we can amend anything if we can get Congress to uh, agree to it. Uh, your recently, well, to, to me recently, your deceased Senator Ted Stevens, he died, what, 10 years ago or more. To me, that's recent. He was an opponent of Indian sovereignty, but he loved ANCSA and he loved the native corporations. Uh, he, he saw that the economic activity they engage in benefits the state. He saw that federal dollars that came to Alaska for the tribal villages and for the regional corporations benefited the state. And so Congress has sometimes done some good things for Alaska, I guess, and Alaska natives, excuse me. So I'm not quite sure what, I'm not the person to ask about what amendments should be made to ANCSA. I never did it. My partner in our firm worked a lot in Alaska. When I worked for the Indian law firm, I really didn't do any Alaska work. So I hate to opine on anything about what, how ANCSA might be amended or, or what would be good or bad. Thank you. Another question, were these practices, I'm assuming the doctrine of discovery, um, about whose knowledge matters and whose doesn't, and isn't this still the case? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by whose knowledge, but of course, Europeans and Americans paid no attention to native peoples. So by knowledge, did you mean like the boundaries of tribal lands? Yes, the United States ignored that too. Uh, in, in treaty negotiations, et cetera, the United States often cheated tribes in the lower 48 states by the boundaries of the reservation. There's a famous treaty from back east. This was English times in Pennsylvania. Uh, you might know why Pennsylvania. It's named after William Penn. And he signed a treaty with some of the tribes there that is called the Walking Man Treaty. The tribe agreed to sell... William Penn any lands that his men could walk in three days, but instead he hired teams of runners and had them run and took all that land. So that's just one example of, you know, what does that have to do with knowledge? Maybe I'm not answering your question at all, but I'm not quite certain what you mean by knowledge. Uh, but that's the answer I have for what I can think of. If that person wants to follow up, what do they mean by knowledge? What kind of knowledge is what I mean? I'll let you know if we have one come in uh, clarifying that. We have a request for a copy of your PowerPoint presentation. If you'd be willing to share that with us and we'll post it if that's okay. Sure, I sent that to Laura already, so. Perfect. And then there have been reconciliation and repatriation efforts in various countries. Do you see any results as just? That's an interesting question. Uh, several countries have done this. Canada has done it, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I, Australia, I think, has done it, maybe New Zealand too. And so there is some talk about that here. I know some people who think it's a waste of time. I don't know that I have an opinion on it. Uh, if all you do is sit around and talk about bad things, but but maybe that teaches historians, maybe that teaches Americans the bad things that happened. But I teach economic development issues, and so we talk a little bit about how poor Indian country is, and then I always go, okay, that's enough of that. Let's talk about what we can do about it. So if a Truth and Reconciliation Commission looks to the future, to improving things, to improving the, the health, 
the life expectancy, the infant mortality rates, the educational standards, the, did I already say the economic conditions of indigenous nations and led and peoples and, and letting indigenous nations rule themselves, then I will be 100% for such a commission. If it's, if it is just sitting around recording bad things that happened, I don't know. Some people think that's not worth the effort and we'd be better off negotiating with the feds and the states for better uh, situations for our peoples. So that's about all I have to say on that. Someone asked, are your classes available to UAF students? Uh, no, the, no. Uh, we have an MLS program, a master's of legal study that a person can sign up for. And right at this time, they only have one Indian law class and I don't teach it, but I did record 18 hours of lectures that the person that teaches it uses. And so the class is available like that. Any of you are welcome to come down here and go to law school at ASU. <laughs> we have seven native professors. I do not think there's a law school in the entire country that has one or two, and we have seven. We have 35 to 70. If you count all our programs, we have 70 Native people enrolled in ASU law programs. So, uh, other, yeah, I'm not, my classes cannot, they will not make them available, you know, free and on the, on the web. Thanks. And we have a question about where this uh, talk will be posted. So I dropped it in the chat again. It will be posted on Northwest Campus's uh, webpage for Shine a Light Speaker Series. Uh, we have someone expressing their thanks. So it's, thank you for such an informative presentation. And uh, another one, thank you for your time. I was a student of the late Jenny Bell Jones here at UAF. I remember reading some of your work through her modules. Oh. Well, thank you all for, if, if we're wrapping up, thank you very much for inviting me. I thank the people that uh, were involved. And I want to tell you that that's more questions than I usually get. So I thank you for having these questions. And obviously this topic, we could go for another hour easily just talking about these things. Plenty of things I'm no expert on. So get that book I referred to, or maybe have uh, someone from Anchorage uh, someone who practices native law. I have students up there who practice uh, native law and are native. So maybe they'd be interested in being one of your speakers one day. Absolutely. This is just such a complex topic. And I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. And thank you, Robert. This was really eye-opening. Um, everyone, please keep an eye out for upcoming Shine a Light presentations at the website that I just linked below. We're on Facebook, uh, Northwest Campus's Facebook page. So if you'd like to share the recording or give feedback, you can do so by uh, following that uh, outreach tab on Northwest Campus's website. Uh, we will now be closing out this webinar. Have a great day and thanks again, everyone. Thank you all.